It's an absolute joy to be with you again. I hope that you are getting something out of these and not that you're getting it from me, but that the word of God is effectually working in you because you read it, you hear it, you research it, you go to the Bible and you check it. It's a wonderful joy to be with you. Today, what I'm dealing with, last week I dealt with salvation and the contradictions because that's why people often feel that, that the Bible is not trustworthy. So I gave a bit of background. Bible is written in a progressive revelation, so there are certain things that will be for people written previously where the revelation of new principles, information will be part of how the old has actually become excluded from our faith. I did deal with the South African constitution and dispensations last week, and once again, I just want to remind you that there may be appearing contradictions it's good that you research. God has sometimes left it that way because our faith must be on information that we've studied and researched. He, he has a most unique way of saying, knock and you shall, the door shall be open. Seek and you shall find. The principle of put your mind into it. Don't just believe because you are supposed to believe. Get the intelligent insight and knowledge. So welcome once again. What a joy to share in the word of God together with you. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to share some things with you and I shall begin them uh, by sharing them with you now. And that is that, um, firstly, there's the, the presentation we normally put up at the beginning. It has my name, it has Lauren's name, my sister, my wife is Janice, not Lauren. And then of course, it's got our technical details. So um, you can have a look. We've had quite a number of People give us feedback, but please remember, I've said it before, remember that it is important to be critical if you think that there's something wrong as it is to be just praiseworthy. And I thank you for the many, many praiseworthy responses I've had, but I just remind you of that. Now, there's something else that I want to do, and that is that um, if you look at that, now there's a picture. There are two people in that picture. Now, that is not my wife neither it is, is it me. It's just a picture of us. But in real life, that is my wife and that's me. I sometimes say, oh, that's not my wife. And people say, oh. And then, of course, I say, it's just a picture of her. But I must say, I thank the Lord for the absolute joy that she is. Now, there's something else. Many of you know about my bike accident on the 3rd of January. It was a buck that jumped into the road. I've always believed you've got to have nice, bright lighting. But of course, the buck will say things it's a nice thing to jump into. And the poor old buck lost his life. But I've now started cycling this week. I used to cycle. I've, I've cycled as fundraisers twice from Cape Town. But I'm getting back into it for exercise. But I must also say that when you're cycling with a four-year-old little boy and a six-year-old little girl, that's Sarah and that's Aaron, my grandchildren. And of course, my wife Janice is standing next to me. But let me tell you, it makes for nice, easy starting on your cycling mode. So those are the things that um, we have. And then, of course, this week we're dealing with the fourth part of the message of salvation. And that is, why do we need to be saved? And what do we need to do? Last week we dealt with salvation. What about contradictions in the Word of God? I hope we clarified that. Um, Obviously, the detail, unless you've studied it, wouldn't be as strong as if, you, if, as if you had studied it. But we know that it's not contradictory. Otherwise, it would be a book worth absolutely nothing. Many people also say that it's accurate in the original manuscripts. Number one, they don't exist, original manuscripts. Number two, there were various sets of copies, not all of which were accurate. But if God could inspire the word by men who wrote the most astounding things, of unknown things that they were that was revealed to them, then he could also preserve it. Because if we have a, a, an original copy, we would think that that's great. But we have copies of the originals that are exactly the same and were preserved, but they're also copies that all the other versions except the King James Bible come from. And that's why in the English language, the King James Bible is absolutely the word of God. It's not just an original, I mean, sorry, uh, a copy of um, an inaccurate original. It is accurate and it's been preserved that way. Now, what I want to do with you today is that we're going to be taking that salvation step another step. And that is that we're going to go to the simple questions of why do we need to be saved 
and what do we need to do to be saved? Is there something we need to do? Now, if that you considering to be being a good person or works, no, there's nothing you can do. The good works don't count for anything in salvation. Your belief and trust does that. And that's what I'm going to deal with with you today. So I want to once again look at that, and I'm going to deal with it. And if we look at it, salvation is only required because of sin. Why would we need to be saved? God created us. He created Adam and Eve. He created the heaven and the earth. The first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Surely if he created it, there wasn't anything wrong with it. But the answer to that is that Adam and Eve were given a perfect world. They were given a place where God could walk with them. There was no sin. There was no unholiness. And hence, God walked in the garden with Adam. But then, of course, along came Satan, and he had been cast out of heaven along with the other angels, as the Bible reveals further on. But he came and he twisted the scriptures. He deceived them, and he pulled them into something where they made a choice that was in objection to God's plan and his design. And sin entered the human nature. Now, when we talk of sin, everybody says, but I'm not the biggest sinner. I'm not a bad person. And you know what happens? Is that, yes, that may be if you're comparing yourself to other people. But when it comes to comparing to God and absolute perfection in every thought, you struggle with you as much as some of the people around you, and I struggle with me in exactly the same way. But that's not the focus God has done. He said, I'll do something about that. I will do a work. I will give you the opportunity of simply trusting me for having died in your place for your sins, and God's justice has been poured out on me. I suffered, yet I'm the creator of the universe. But I did it so that I could become a human and stand in your place before God. And that's how we are saved, by trusting that, because Christ was beaten, he was whipped, he was spat upon, he was absolutely treated like the bottom rungs of humanity, but he was also God. And yet he chose not to impose his power because he had to represent us. So he became God, man, and our representation before God, where God's wrath and justice was poured out. So that is why we have to be saved, be saved because we are born in the likeness of Adam, not in the image of God, because that disappeared. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, but when they sinned, the Bible says that he, the children, the, the development of the nations, were born in the likeness of Adam. So we know we're born with a shortcoming. There's not a child who is not a toddler, a tiny toddler, who doesn't lie, who doesn't try to take stuff behind your back when you've got a bottle of biscuits there. It's an incredible thing. And God says, I know you came short. You trusted Adam and Eve, or you, should I say you're part of Adam and Eve, but I've compensated because if you trust me, there will be no problem. So what I'm saying is that if we look at that, and this is where I want to say that um, Adam and Eve were the cause. They never had a Bible because God was present with them because it was a perfect world at the beginning. He didn't need to have a, his Bible because he walked with them. He spoke to them. And when sin entered, he had to withdraw because it was no longer a perfect world. But what's interesting is that it will be a perfect world again. Now, all of us need to be saved from the consequence of sin, which is eternal damnation, not because of the fact that God chooses to punish us, but we choose to follow the deception of not trusting Christ. Now, when I say that, I must also say that um, we are accountable to God because we are made by him. So we can't say, no, well, I don't want to believe in God. I'll go option three. I don't want heaven. I don't want a lost eternity called hell, but I'm just going to reject God. And I, no, that doesn't work because we are made and we are accountable to God because he's our creator. But because of his love, he whitewashed and he sidestepped that and he said, I will pay for your sin, but you just need to trust me and believe in me. It's very much like a family member. I came from Rhodesia during the war. My brothers were in the war. And you know that if they were out in, let's call it a foreign country, and they were being attacked and they couldn't get back, if I had the money and I bought them a ticket and I sent it to them and the, the bus or the plane stopped right next to them, they could hold the ticket in their hand, reject to get on, and the consequence would be theirs, not mine. 
Now, that's a pretty poor illustration of how God works, but I need you to know, God is not trying to make you do something. He's offering you redemption. He's offering, he's like the ambulance man that came to me. Imagine if I said no to the ambulance man, I don't want to see you. My accident could have very, and would have very much been fatal. So it's not that we have to, it's that we understand and choose to believe in God and Jesus Christ because he died for our sins, was buried and rose again. So what I'm saying is that's what happened. Now the Bible tells us amazingly, it's the writing of, of, of a religious matter, but it's not religious, it's a relationship, it's a love letter, that we know where we come from. We know why we need salvation. The history of the world is recorded in that right up until 2,000 years ago. And we know what and how God is working today and what the final outcome will be in the new heaven and the new earth. And Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. He had a purpose in perfection. That got basically steamrolled out the way. But you know what people say to me? Why didn't God just let it be? I wouldn't have to go through this tough world. Can I tell you? We would never worship God the way we should if we did not know how he has saved us from the consequence of sin, which is a lost eternity. So our love is ingrained. And God is never at the threat or at the mercy of those things that are Satan's plan or imperfection. Now, amazingly, Luke 3 takes Jesus Christ's lineage back to Adam in the form of Mary. And, of course, he was not the biological child of Joseph. Joseph was Mary's husband, not the father of, God, of Jesus Christ. But he remained God, but became human so that he could die in our place on the cross and take our sin as he represented us. Now, that's what the Bible actually says. So, we are all from one blood, from Adam. Acts 17 says that we are all from that one blood. Adam and Eve are our forefathers. Um, it's many, many generations, but that is true. And then it says, and this is how we know, because the book of Acts 17, 26 says, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And then, of course, wherever we are, how one of the things is that we all deserve it. Do you know one of the most difficult things is to believe that you could go to hell and that you would never be able to raise your hand and say to God, but what am I doing here? You'll say, but I bought you freedom. I gave you a free ticket. And that was simply trusting me to have died for your sins. So my question to you is, what are you doing there? It's absolutely insane that we should walk away from such a gift. And you know what? The ignorance comes because men do not read the Bible. They follow religious people who are full of philosophy, but not truth. And furthermore, there's also the aspect that we grow up and we think that it's folly. We think that it's just a childish thing. That is not the case whatsoever. It's the truth. And God has put it in black and white. He's not only written it so we could read it and be saved. He's also written it for the unbeliever will be accountable because it was in existence. He could have looked at it, but he refused. And that is rebellion. It is rejection but it is opting for Satan's plan for your life. And there are two plans for your life in this world. The one is God's, through love, through grace, through Jesus Christ, through a new identity, a new beginning. And the other is Satan who'd want to keep you in the stronghold that he's got you. And he sends out some beautiful things, like people get involved in all sorts of good works and good things to do. And they think, well, maybe God will approve me. No, God only approves you when you are in Christ and you've trusted him. It's not your works. It is your belief and trust that makes you his. Then you can go on to good works, which I'm going to touch on later. So as we look at this, I must tell you that the reality is that hell was never God's intention for us. He made Adam and Eve perfect, but Satan had already fallen. He was already thrown out of heaven along with a third of the angels. And when that happened, God made hell for the devil and his angels. And when we reject Christ, we are opting to go with the devil and his angels because we don't realize there's no other option because God created and he offered us heaven. We walk away from it. Many people do. I'm grateful I didn't and I'm sure you're grateful you didn't. But it says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. 
So God does not send us there, but if we refuse to receive his grace, we send ourselves there. If we rebel, we fall into Satan's plan, not God's invitation to the eternal life. And by simple trust and belief in what he says in a book in black and white from him, for us to understand, we can know and be assured of peace that we're never going to make that mistake. And then many do not understand it is not our works that save us, but our believing what Christ did for us. Do you know how many people think, well, if I'm a good person and I don't murder and I don't rape and I don't kill and I don't do this and I don't do that, then God will accept me. No, you've still got an attitude, you've got lies in your mind, you've got anger, you've got hatred. Those are things that are human. God doesn't just judge what we do. He judges what we think. And that's why he says, I'll give you a new mind in Christ. That we'll struggle with this imperfection till the final day being on earth. But you know what happens? When Christ died for us, we become what the Bible calls in Christ. And the Bible says that when we are in Christ, God sees us in the righteousness or the right perfection of Christ because we are in him. So it's not our works. And Romans 4.4 4 deals with works and deals with the fact that if we worked for God to actually save us, God would be indebted to us. And that's why no one unforgivable in Christ's grace. There's nobody who cannot be saved because it's not what we do, not what we have done. And if you're listening, maybe the things in your life you're very uh, threatened by because they were so evil and so wrong. Please, don't let them be a burden over you. Christ has forgiven them. Learn that guilt brings the grace to the fore. Now listen to these beautiful words of Paul. Um, and he was the worst of the worst because he went around murdering Christian people. Not Christians, they were actually people that were unsaved, but unsaved into the message of Christ, which was a kingdom. And what the Bible calls the little flock were those who were saved and those who were part of a kingdom on earth at that stage, which fell away because they rejected. But First Timothy 2.4, Paul the Apostle, who is the one who, who Christ writes through to us particularly, says, who will have all men to be saved? This is God's plan. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now remember, if God created Adam and Eve and we are all linked, we got to listen to the God that is the creator. And therefore, all men are linked because we have the blood and the lineage back to Adam. Uh, Adam. And therefore, this verse points out that we have to trust Christ, everyone evermore. And sin is just the rejection and the belief of the word of God and the word of truth. So um, we all deserve hell. There's no doubt about it. You may not think so. You may think, but you're not that bad. You haven't murdered, you haven't raped, you haven't killed, you haven't done this, you haven't done that. Your works are not what counts. You've thought evil thoughts. You've said things to people that you've never even realized have crushed them by the words that you win an argument with and you, de you destroy the person. We all like that. We have a history like that. But what I'm saying is that Christ is an open doorway to the newness that he brings to life where we may even still do those things. But when God sees us, he sees us in Christ who was perfect. So he sees us as what the Bible calls saints rather than sinners. Sinners is the state we were before we had faith. Saints is the status we hold before God. But I can tell you, if I ask your wife if you're a saint, <laughs> she may love you, but she also knows you're not much of a saint because we are still in an imperfect world. And Paul writes about that in Romans 6, 7 and 8. And he details that so beautifully. But let's get back to the notes as we go through this. And what I want to make sure that you, you get and you get right is that um, we all deserve hell. We can't point a finger in God at God because Adam and Eve sank us. He made us all part of that fallen people that God designed. Hell is not God's intention for us, but for Satan and his angels that rebelled at Matthew 24. Um, my apologies, I went over there. Matthew 24, sorry, Matthew 25, 41 says, Then shall you say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So many people say, How can I believe in a God who sends people to hell? No, he doesn't. He offers them heaven. 
if they reject it, they choose for themselves. I want to go to the devil and his angels in the eternal fire. Everlasting fire? There's no reverse. There's no way to get out of it. But why would you want to do that when God offers such love that he gave God the Son to die for you? And then it goes on and say, I say that if we re rebel, we walk in Satan's plan, not God's invitation to eternal life by simply believing what he explains so clearly. So the Bible is given in black and white. Many do not understand it is not our works that save us, but our believing what Christ did for us. Romans 4, 3 and 4 and those verses is where Paul, the apostle, has Christ authoring through him the incredible description of what salvation is and that works being a good person will never save you, but trusting Christ will change you and it will give you an identity. And from that, you will not desire to just drop out of things. So we try, we save by trusting objective faith in truth. And then good works are firstly the study of learning God's teaching, otherwise known as sound doctrine. You know, I hear so many people talk about good works. And you know what? I hear them saying, but we do good works and we belong to this organization and we're feeding these people and we're doing that. Good works are certainly a love for others and things like that. But you will remain in ignorance and you will remain ignorant of what God would desire you to do, how he works, who he is, what you're going to share with those people you're feeding to save their souls. And you know, the truth is, and forgive me for being blatant here, but it's serious. We are all accountable to God, whether we like it or not, saved or unsaved. God doesn't say, well, you're unsaved, so you're not accountable. He says, why aren't you saved? But what happens is that in that setup, if we feed the poor and we do not tell them of what salvation is, which is our series, that it is by Christ's finished work, by believing that you are saved, all we do is we fatten a person. And if they were to become wealthy because we train them in something, they will be exceptionally wealthy, healthy, etc. But when they take their last breath, they are not right with God because good works do not save us. And as I say, the Apostle Paul, inspired by Christ to write these words to us, says works can never save us. So um, it sounds strange because we think all Christians are good people. They are good by Christ. They're not good in their own right. Um, so anyway, and then good works um, are not, good works are not works the unsaved can do. In other words, if you're going to do something good, the unsaved can do it. How do you compete or compare? Um, and if you want to take a moment and, you, and you're watching this, you can either read it, but I just want to say that when we think what we do enables us to be God's children, we insult what Christ did and we make a fool of him and we call him a liar that we should need him. Satan loves this because it replaces the work of Christ with our works and many who do much in the church do it for the assurance of salvation, which is wrong. Once we trust Christ, we are saved he will never take that gift of eternal life back. So we never have to worry about not making it to heaven. And then Satan gives tons of false credit for good works of part of pleasing or making us think that it's pleasing God for salvation. And through it, nine times out of 10, man says, I'm not such a bad person. Look what I did here. Look what I did there. And he claims it all as ego. And many times, if he does something like giving huge amounts of money to the church, he thinks he's done what pleases God. You can't please God. He owns the universe. So what you give is not going to make God say, wow, what a good person. What it might do is say, wow, that guy understands how important the gospel is. But then it's not given as a good work. It's given as a response to the grace of God. And then, of course, God just doesn't just offer salvation. He explains where it comes from and a plan and purpose, past, present, and future, progressive from the beginning to the end. Genesis to Revelation reveal that. and grace. Nobody can do without it. Nobody can be saved without it. And it's found in the person of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. And then salvation is so simple. You just believe truth that is stated and truth believed and truth that becomes effectual that you, your personality changes. And that's why very often when a man who's been wild changes because Christ's a part of his life, his wife will say, he's just so different to what he used to be. He's so kind. He's so loving because he's being fueled by that truth. Now, thank you for participating in this. Remember, re-watch it, re-listen to it. 
You can study and understand from the verses. Go and research them. And please contact us for further info if you wish. And with joy, we will respond. Then our Bible study, we had technical issues during the week. Unfortunately, it, it stalled my getting them out on Tuesdays. We're looking at Tuesdays, 7 p.m. every week. We've resolved those issues. So there will be a message this week and beginning a deeper study of the biblical understanding of the Word of God. And then if you have any support gifts that you want to give, maybe you feel you'd like to support what we're doing, remember there is no obligation but a free will gift if you wish. And you have to get value and you have to research so that you can sponsor the work that we are doing for the sake of Christ and the gospel. But you must make sure, because your giving is not the key. Why you give is what counts to God, and it must be based on His Word alone. So the name is Grace Now Ministries, the Standard Bank in Warmer Branch, Port Elizabeth, which doesn't need a branch code because it's got a universal one. The account number is 242649319. If you were taking a note there, 242649319. And if for reference, if you want to put it on there, you can remain totally anonymous. You can give one rand, you can give 10, you can give whatever you want. Um, obviously, you just fuel our ability to continue and to not continue, but to expand the work that we're doing. So as a reference, please put FB, your country that you're from, if you're outside of South Africa, and your name, or just anonymous. Um, so giving is between you and the Lord. You don't have to put your name. I'm telling you now, that it's one of the biggest areas of abuse in churches is financially. And they try and make you think that God is trying to get your money out of your pocket. But actually, I'm convinced it's more them and the organization than the work that they are doing. Because a good work, remember, starts with solid doctrine. Many churches don't have sound doctrine. They are mixing up all the different sections of the scripture so they're not dividing it rightly, as Paul says. They're not apportioning, apportioning it as they should, but they also can use any verse and manipulate you. And as I may have said before, the wording, there is no God, is in the Bible on two occasions. So I could quote that and say, this comes from the Bible. There's no God. But in actual fact, can I tell you something? I would be quoting the Bible out of context because the two verses are identical. And they say, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, the fool is not a fool just because he's a fool. He's a fool because Satan wants him to think that. And you know why? Because he doesn't want to be accountable to anybody. The irony is that you're not accountable to Christ even when you believe in him. But you desire to serve him and you are not accountable for your sin anymore because he paid for it. So it's such a beautiful message. It is so unhuman nature like that it has to be from god and i want to say to you if you've listened thank you so much and remember research study know why you believe and your salvation will tell you that salvation is god's purpose because he doesn't want to miss one of us in heaven which he will do if we're not with him in heaven but you know what he doesn't say you have to do a thing. He says, I've done everything. You can be saved, carry on in ignorance, carry on in sin. Because Paul writes to the Corinthian people, let me tell you, they had problems. And he says, you are babes in Christ. They were going to go to heaven, but they lost the opportunity of living in such a beautiful way to honor God. Thank you for joining us. And I trust in Christ, you will know how enriched, blessed, and how inspirational and enthusiastic we become when we are in that. A blessed day to you.